okay. And it's nothing personal. No, no. It's just business. It's just business. In the economic crisis and late stage capitalism. The second issue area or area that we want to focus on in terms of what we want in our constitution is the political crisis, the emerging blatant fascism. That's the way we define it. Um, and y'all get y'all get that because we've talked a little bit about it. I don't want to gloss over anything, but we need to get these. So the one thing I do want to really mm -hmm. uh, lift up around the political crisis is that, that we believe. The, the capitalist parties, both the Democratic and the Republican parties, being in service to the system that currently exists. Okay. Now, it, it, we're not saying what the answer necessarily has to be, but at least an understanding that the capitalist parties are actually part of the problem. Uh, and then, what, what do we do with that? Like, that's a big question, but we don't want to gloss over that part of the political crisis is the reality that the two-party system that we have been that has been imposed upon us exists again for a reason. Yes. But part of the way I would say the same thing is that both political parties are for sale and being bought or bought. That's right. And if you know, so when we participate, we're just helping them to do what the corporations have already paid them to do, and they're not accountable to us. They're accountable to who bought them, and that's not us. The ecological crisis is the third area to think about when we're thinking about a new constitution since the earth is being destroyed. Yes. And then the legal crisis. The current constitution is the supreme law of the land. As Robin says, there's none of these protections for economic rights, environmental rights, social justice, racial justice. None of that is in the current constitution. So those are the four areas that we think this falls into if we start thinking about it. So any questions? Before we move on, this race was created in order to prevent these very conversations from right. happening, right. right? It's right. really important that we, and we have to, that's why we have to talk about patriarchy and white supremacy and capitalism in the same breath because we cannot win. You see, it's not because I want to get a gold star from women for being a good male ally. It's because I want to win. And my analysis is we cannot win unless we actually talk about all these things at once. Here's the other trick. If we actually get comfortable talking about them all at once, I can't, I can't help but to believe we can't help but to win. That's right, because it can't be um, a weapon against us. Correct. For profit. Right. So you have a lack of ethical base in that identity as it relates mm -hmm. to power and the power dynamics and running governments and the for-profit incentive. So there's no moral ethical uh, a component to a quote-unquote corporation which has human rights. That's right. Claire, you got something brief? I just, with all that, I'm just interested in where are the right among other species mm -hmm. to exist. That's right. And that that is what's being um, actually just, I mean, 10 trees went down in my neighborhood for a 12-story hotel by a corporation that is not going to serve anybody who lives in the neighborhood. And I, I just, you know, it's not my human right to have those trees as much as those trees inherently That's right. is what I'm trying to say. Uh, some textile plants, and they kill over, <laughs> kill, kill people for trying to uh, formalize the union. They started lies, you know, like uh, Donald Trump lie. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, it was a thing about um, telling white men that if you unionize plants, that the white females would have to work alongside the black males, and you know that's just like. White man said, "Oh no, that ain't gonna oh, no. never happen." <laughs> you know, in the 1940s and the 1930s. So you know, they've used and you know, uh, establishment. You know, the government and uh, and people of power, business people, have used any tool necessary to get their way and impose their way on us as people. And then you know, and what we got to do as citizens is we got to wake up. We got to realize that it's important to come up with our own plans and not rely on so-called leaders a lot of time to lead us. You know, we got to lead them. <laughs> you know, uh, unions, are, are, you know, are great. You know, uh, he was talking about pensions. You know, we put, we, uh, and, and they, they manipulated everybody. They replaced our pensions with 401ks, <laughs> you know, that benefit corporate America and Wall Street, and, you know, we get what's left. <laughs> you know, you, you can work a, a career and at the end of your uh, work life, they're going to tell you, well, you got $150,000, you got $200,000. What you going to do with that? 
<laughs> you know, and this economy. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and now, if, you know, like I say, people that work for uh, school systems, I know my sister was a school teacher for 30 years, she got a pension, <laughs> you know, because they actually not, uh, not a real union, but they are a union, <laughs> you know. But if you. They changed that too. They're changing that too. <laughs> I work with businesses to our state because none of them want unions. Mm -hmm. They pick our state mm -hmm. because we have no unions. And we got slave labor. We got slave labor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And and so the question then is, so if we we manage to change the people's viewpoint and we manage to to get unions back into, to um, popular alike, then what's what's going to be used to attract those businesses? to our state so that we actually can have those jobs that are now protected by the union. You know, I make my most profit and not spend the most money. I can go to these other countries. I can outsource these jobs. All these jobs that from Pennsylvania on down, from Greensboro on down here. Um, I can leave the United States. I don't have to pay them $10, 12 $15 an hour. I can pay $15, 16 an hour. Get more, um, more stuff done, make more profit. I mean, that's why those jobs are gone. Right. Like the people in Vietnam and the Philippines and mm -hmm. Cambodia, and, you know, and, and make sure that their wages are rising. Because when their wages are rising, it, it improves our chances. A fifteen dollar, yeah, a fifteen dollar minimum wage would do wonders for South Carolina. <laughs> and change, not the policies, because as we know, the policy ain't working. Right. The, the policy shifts aren't working right now. So, what can we do as individuals, as organizers, to change? All of those things in this. Can, can, I, can I offer an observation? We need to go together. We, we need to stop being separate. That's that's the problem. Mm -hmm. We need to have a conglomeration. We all working towards the same things. There's no glory in it. There's no oh this person did this. No, we did this. We all come together. We work we work individually in our own areas, our own states, our own regions where we are. But we come together and we get the same issues out to all the politicians. We fight the legislatures. We, we have it coming in all directions. And so I, to me, that's how I figured out we need to do this. AT&T has a lobbyist. All the utilities have a lobbyist. So when those bills hit the floor, the lobbyist's jobs are to provide information to the legislators because many don't really know what's yeah. going on. So I'd like to see poor folk don't have lobbyists. There's no lobbyists that represents the best interests of the poor. So we really need to come together, pool our resources, and put a lobbyist, All you right. know, in these chambers. The demand that people make as represented by human rights as opposed to civil rights. Um, it's a very uh, important distinction that, that is made. We make, um, we challenge people to participate in that process with the recognition of the fact that the United, St that the United Nations has no army, that um, it is totally financially dependent on its member states and largely the United States for its financial existence but that at the same time, because of the vanity of the United States, the, uh, the dishonesty of the United States in its mythology and its quest to present itself. Um, under the New Jim Crow movement, most people know us because of Farid Mersanal. We were the campaign that started a campaign for her where we had 38,000 members across the U.S. while wanting to have Marissa Alexander a black woman standing her ground with a gun in her hand so that her husband, who was abusive, um, she, you know, she, eight days after she gave birth, would not go to jail. Um, so instead, the racial uh, piece that we have, which is also, you know, regarding our issue on patriarchy, is the factor that Marissa was given a 20-year sentence in this court after a quick deliberation, right? And then after that 20 year sentence, because we fought back to say this is not okay, she tried to give her 60 years. And that's Angela Corey. So we're talking about a person figure, right, when we say a DA. But that's, you know, really, she's, our, our goal is to get rid of her. But, you know, when we hear um, what um, I hear Fia saying and stolen lives, what it means to me, 
is that there are pieces that this is being justified across the country, racial profiling. profiling. And, you know, so there's one group that's the Stolen Lives Matter, and then we have another group, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement's Operation Ghetto Storm, where we have pictures of families in our, from Miami to Jacksonville, um, of our families, we can just bring it to City Hall, bring them to them and say, look, here's another family member that was killed. And I have that for those that want a copy of those Operation Ghetto Storm, but because it shows the picture, it shows what happened, and just like the stolen lives, it keeps us to remember we must show the faces. You know, we must bring them out. A lot of times we use Paolo Freddy's uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, and we have the youth to be them in shackles, you know, we've had me after the um, every 26 hours from Malcolm X Operation Ghetto Storm report. Uh, we also had the convening Black Lives Matter demands, which is where we just left. You know, for those that want to know, let me know. I have copies of those as well. Um, the other thing was that Black Lives Matter in the court case where I'm serving 100 uh, community service hours, you know, and paying the state for protesting. All 19 of us where you know, they had our our little cover up from the mech shots when they did our fingerprints and they put us on every day as what? Terrorists. Not protesters, terrorists. Literally, we were on TV almost every day because we are the ones that fought against Trayvon with Zimmerman and of course Zimmerman and Angela Corey has something together. Don't let it fool you. The DA had a lot to do with that. She is the best friend of our Rick Scott. I hope you all love him. Our governor. <laughs> is best friends with her. It's not by accident. So Zimmerman, of course, was going to be let free, but we glad the rest of the country knows why. You know, and then the same thing with Jordan Davis and Marissa. So when Angela Corey saw us taking Black Lives Matter, getting on Mad Dog on a uh, highway in 95, she wanted all of us in jail. So what did they do? They arrested all 19 of us, put us in separate cop cars, put us under this jail, four floors below, which is a parking lot, left us there for four hours with our handcuffs. This is just January, December, actually. Handcuffed, and the police officer said, ah, I'm getting, I must be getting off for time. I don't know why she's got you all in the back. It's not us. Don't be mad at us. We know y'all just protesting like everybody else in the country. Police officers saying this. And in four different cars, we asked her, well, why are you, what's going on? It's Angela Corey. She's out to get y'all. You know, so the repression is real um, from when, you know, when we hear um, Afia saying what has happened in the past, where she is, to right now, our youngest member of the Jacksonville 19 was 20. Yeah, 20. You know, all 19 of us, some of them were occupied. I'm with the, you know, Black, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, with the Southern Freedom Movement. Some of us were the Veterans for Peace. Some of us was Comedic Nation. You know, some of us, we, you know, we were a mosh podge of progressive agencies that finally came together and took something on together. And in our court case, they laughed at us. Let it be documented that they laughed when we, and he asked me, so you saying, oh, <laughs> Black Lives Matter, huh? I'm like, yes, we are. And then he says, well, oh, so you're saying it's not important that all lives matter. And this is the state of Florida, as you would know, if, it's, if we get it in court, then we want them to act a fool. We want them to show themselves, because now these youth, through popular education, is going to dramatize what happened in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. We want people to see how they laugh. And then the judge spoke said, well, that has nothing to do with us in Florida. Who cares about Michael Brown and Eric Garner? He said this out of his mouth, y'all. We want them to do that. Get arrested so they can say what they need to say so we can show when we go to the United Nations, how crazy these people are thinking that our human lives are not necessary to do what's important in the First Amendment right. We have every right to protest. And so I said, yeah, okay, uh, Judge, Your Honor, you said uh, Michael Brown and Eric Gardner doesn't matter, but uh, what about three streets from here? Last year, the young man, and you met his son, the blind boy that came, his brother, was killed in front of his house in front of his three children and his mother. And still those police have not been brought to justice. That's three streets away. And the judge, oh, 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 well, you know. And then they laughed again when we said Black Lives Matter. I said, well, this is amazing how we really do need to have this recording of what y'all saying because what you're saying to me is that the Bar Association is who we also need to hold accountable. Why? Where's the culture competency? 
How were you able to get your law degree, state of Florida, lawyer, if you can't even be culturally competent to know this isn't a funny matter? And we said bar association. So again, there's all kinds of tactics that we're thinking about, not just uh, dramatizing the youth and talking about racial profiling and how they're laughing at our movement, our nationwide movement, but to say, where are we looking at this whole thing about cultural competency in this little booklet also, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when the youth read this and they're dissecting it, right, rights of e to equality, freedom from democracy, uh, discrimination, right to life and liberty, freedom from slavery, all of these are still happening. And they're putting it right now, it's going to be a little thing, because my daughters, they do a little hip-hop and they have a little way with it, and they, you know, they talk. So, but they're dramatizing it in their own way, and I think what's important is that they get to, to say it and verbalize it and have this political education and to be able to do it in the projects they're going to. In the high school where Jordan Davis used to go to school, the boy with the loud music, amongst his friends, and this is what we should be doing, bringing this, because racial profiling is that. And um, so please join us, get information I have at the table, even our declaration. Uh, the reason I'm here, first time involved with this human rights movement, is because I'm compelled to tell you the situation the Latin families are living every day. Uh, for the fact that they are living here, they're working here, but the state uh, doesn't allow to issue driver license. Uh, more than 10 states in the United States uh, regardless of the um, status of the people, they issue a restricted driver license where uh, they can get insurance and no <coughs> just driving without any papers. And in bad luck, if you ended up having an accident with a person that doesn't have a papers, well, you don't have nothing to claim because they don't have insurance. So there's many things that uh, regarding economics, uh, everybody talk about economics, the state will gain some kind of uh, money coming into and, uh, the lives of other people. And the most important thing, they will know exactly where Jose or Rafael lives and will be a way to trap down because most of the Latin families that live here um, we are honest people that we care about our family and uh, good workers and the, the only thing we want to live is in, in peace. I mean, the fact that a mother has to take the kids to a school or to the doctor and to be looking behind the shoulder all the time, it's a, that's a human rights issue. They live in a state of fear every day, 24 hours. And um, this is something that uh, nothing to compare with the issue of black people that have been suffering 200 years. This is another situation, a human rights, in a different context. This is families, and still you see not only black, the race, uh, racial profile, you always see a police stopping an old beat up car with a Latin looking guy. So they are profiling. And the thing is they don't have any rights to call a, a family to take the car out. No, they, they take him to jail and top of that, they impound the car and when after a week he's let it out, he goes for the car, he's charged $300, $500, on top of a family that already are with a minimum wage and just scraping to survive. So I'm glad I'm here and I met all you guys and I would love to keep up this situation in collaboration with all the people. We are all in the same boat and different things. So we have to fight back against this situation and just to put a voice in the paper, in the radio, that something is wrong. And, and, and not only in this state, other states that they have this police uh, fascist mentality that they exercise no matter who you are. Just, uh, so I think that's uh, 
something that I, I'm glad I'm here and just to follow examples of states that they issue nowadays. I'm not going to do that. It's wrong. I'm not selling out my people. They send in economic hitmen. They've actually gone in and killed political people to get them out of the way in order to take over and set up those coups. Genocide has been committed in the name of corporations. The United States of America is a corporation. And yes, sir. And more often than not, yes, there's, there's been assassinations, but more often than not, the term refers uh, to, you know, like uh, the first week of uh, Obama's presidency, the economic hitmen show up and say, congratulations, Mr. President, now let us show you what you're going to do. Otherwise, we're going to take your economy down. That, that's how they manipulate. And, and if they have, and, and you're right, there was a field organizer was for the America's Watch. Um, I wanted to talk about the impact of militarization at home and abroad, and um, and also begin thinking of the idea of what it means when we're talking about the South. Um, the reality is there are many SOAs in the United States. There are over 200 military training sites here in the United States, not just on military bases, but there's also military universities. There's the Defense University, et cetera, et cetera. And, what happens here has a multiplying effect when you go back to countries like Colombia, who's the worst client for uh, School of the Americas. Um, and when we talk about the worst perpetrators of human rights violations, I'm not talking about the dirty wars in Argentina only, which you know cost like 30,000 disappearances. Um, I'm also talking about more recently the 2009 U.S.-backed coup in Honduras, led by two SOA graduates. I'm talking about the president who's in Guatemala right now, who is now in jail and he just resigned. He's also um, linked to corruption scandals right now, but he is our guy for over 30 years. Um, he was trained here in the United States, Oco Perez Molina, and was in charge of the scorched earth campaigns at the height of Guatemala's 36 year civil war, um, which culminated in a genocide by another SOA graduate, former dictator, General Efraín Rios Montt. So there's a lot of kind of who's who from, from this school. Um, we're on our 25th anniversary this year. We will have a convergence once again at the gates of Fort Benning. We can talk about that later. Um, so going back to um, this idea of like the South, who's in the South? Brothers and sisters from the South are coming to the United States, fleeing, not necessarily coming. We need to change that discourse. They're coming to you know live the American dream. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. Um,